Uh, this morning, I want to read from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen. It's fascinating, right? The word abolish, right? We, uh, we, uh, here in America, we had a movement called the abolition movement, and it was to abolish slavery. And Jesus Christ has led the ultimate abolition movement, not simply to abolish slavery, but to abolish death itself. And he did that for us on the cross and in his resurrection, whenever he uh, rose from the grave, uh, bringing us new life. So this morning at this time, we usually take uh, a moment to acknowledge our sins together, a confession of sins, because one of the things Jesus has done for us is he has brought immortality to life through the gospel. He has saved us not because of our works, but because of his kindness. And one of the wonderful things that this does for us is it puts us all on an equal playing field. I read recently it democratizes us. So we are all equally sinners in need of God's grace. So this morning, I'm going to read a short prayer from an early church uh, father uh, confessing sin. I, wanted, I want us to, I'm going to read this prayer. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me uh, silently, close our eyes together. But I'm going to read this. This is from Ambrose, who was a pastor in the early church. And it's a short prayer, but a prayer of confession uh, for sins, but also of great confidence in God's mercy. So will you pray with me uh, this, this morning? Oh, Lord. You who are all merciful, take away my sins from me and enkindle within me the fire of your Holy Spirit. Take away this heart of stone from me and give me a heart of flesh and blood, a heart to love and adore you, a heart which may delight in you, love you and please you. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. And we have this confidence, don't we? Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. Almighty infinite father, faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Good morning. I am glad you're here this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all of you to whom that may apply. I don't want to miss anybody in that. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you want to turn with me to Genesis, Genesis chapter 41 is where we find ourselves this morning. We were in this chapter last week. We got through the first 45 verses. Today we're going to finish the chapter. Where we left off last week, Joseph was brought out of prison. He was placed in the presence of Pharaoh. He interprets Pharaoh's dream. You remember Pharaoh had a couple of dreams. Uh, so he interprets this dream to Pharaoh, much to Pharaoh's liking. But then he, remember, he told him how to manage the situation. It wasn't just here's the dream and what it means, but it's also here's what we now need to do. And in doing this, Pharaoh sees that God's hand is on Joseph, he even makes mention of that, that God's hand is on Joseph. And so he puts Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. Joseph now was in charge of everything. He was only second to Pharaoh himself. 
That's the only thing that the Bible said. That's the only thing Joseph didn't have was the throne. That's all. That's, that's it. Everything else in Egypt was his and was under his authority. And you remember Pharaoh gives Joseph new clothes. He puts gold around his neck. He gives him a signet ring, which shows he's in charge. He gives him a chariot and parades him around Egypt so that the, they would all bow their knee uh, to Joseph. And then he also gave him a wife. He also gave him a new name, an Egyptian name. And so Joseph really was a rags to riches story, or really he was a riches to rags to riches to rags to riches, again, uh, story that he had. Yet with all of this happening, it was a good story. We, we talked about his humiliation brought to exaltation, and we, we saw how Christ was the same. Christ's humiliation to his exaltation, but then how also we who are saved by Christ, who are in Christ, we have that same story of being in humiliation because of our sin, but being exalted because we're exalted on high with Christ. And so hopefully you remember that uh, from last week, which was a good thing. But there's more to this story, isn't there? Joseph had a plan, but the fact is Joseph needed to pull off the plan. Maybe Maybe you've had a job interview before, and maybe you're really good at talking. And so you have this job interview, and you talk, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh no, they gave me the job. Now I've got to come through. I talked the big game. I said that I could handle this. I said that I could do the job, but then the question rolls into your mind on Monday when you're driving to work for the first time, or now your office has moved up to the next floor, whatever the case might be. I would guess many of us sit and wonder, can I really do this? And Joseph talked the big game. This is the dream. This is what needs to be done. And he didn't have much time to think about it because all of a sudden he was on a chariot being paraded around to see Egypt and for the people to bow their knee to him. And the question that remains is, can Joseph actually pull this off? Can he pull off what he said needed to be done? And so we look at that this morning in verses 46 through the end of the chapter. Again, we're going to read it in two sections so we can try our best to follow along. So look with me in verse 46. It says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it. <clears throat> and Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for he could not be measured. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of An, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardships and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. <clears throat> so the Bible tells us here that Joseph was 30 years old when he finds himself in charge of one of the greatest nations on earth. And you might think like me, this is some task for a 30-year-old man. But now getting to know Joseph, as we've had over the past few weeks, we know that Joseph isn't your average 30-year-old man at this point in his life. He has been through quite a bit. He's seen the worst of the worst, but he's also been able to see some of the best. He's been blessed with great success, and we've seen why this is. He's been blessed with success simply for the fact that God's hand was on him. The Bible continues to tell us that. Joseph is succeeding. Yes, he seems to be wise. He seems to be a good guy. But he is succeeding because God's hand <clears throat> is on him. And so in verse 46 through 50, we see Joseph getting to work. Right? He talked this talk, so now it's time to get to work. And so he leaves the presence of Pharaoh. And the Bible tells us he goes all around the country monitoring the land. He's looking at the land. He's seeing the land. You've got to remember, Egypt wasn't his home. He was brought here unwillingly. He's a slave in this land. And so now he's going around Egypt and he's looking to see what's going on all throughout this kingdom. 
And we know that the Lord gave him a plan. We know this, we saw this last time, but now the question is executing it and how difficult that really would be. Because we're not talking about a few people. We're talking about a lot of people in the land of Egypt who are going to face this famine, who are going to need food after these seven years. And so, Joseph, how are you going to do this? And so the Bible tells us how he does this. Joseph sets up storehouses all throughout the land in all the cities. It wasn't just central in the city that he was in. No, he went through all of these, it says, and he set up these local storehouses. And the plan was to take 20% of the grain from each town and put this into the storehouses each year. And it seems like with great efficiency, this happens, right? Joseph is organizing this. And it also seems like all the people are falling in line. All the people are listening to this. If you've ever been a manager before, if you've ever been a boss, if you've ever been a coach, if you've ever been in a position of any over anyone, you know that there's always people. No matter what the plan is, it could be the best plan in the world. There's always some who say, what? This plan stinks. And it's hard to manage people. Right? It, it, it's difficult to deal with people. That is why people like to move to Alaska and not be around what? People. Because all they got to do is deal with themselves. That might be your dream one day. I have no idea. But Joseph had to manage a lot of people. And he was trying to put them and encourage them to do this with the storehouses and the 20%. And according to God's word here, the people seem to fall in line. They listen to him. They respect him. They respect what he is doing. And what does the Bible tell us happens? Well, the Bible tells us that the Lord blesses, once again, not just Joseph's work, but also blesses the land. You see, at this time, Egypt had always been known as a fertile place because of the Nile River. It was so fertile that it was called the breadbasket of the region. And even during the Roman Empire, it was Egypt who would provide Rome with most of their, most of their food, right? And so this was a place that growth would happen and take place. And so it's not odd that they're having good seasons. But according to what we have here in Scripture, there is a miraculous amount of food happening. There's a miraculous amount of growth happening from the crops over these seven years that the Bible actually comes out and says the Egyptians, they couldn't even count it anymore. Now, I'm no <clears throat> great historian, but I can read. And we see that in Egypt, they were very diligent. They were very diligent to write down what we had and what we didn't have. They were the Scott Slater of the group. That's Scott amongst the three pastors. That's that's how he thinks. I'm like, just, we got food. Who cares? He's like, no, I need to know exact amount. Grams, right? Calories, all these things. <clears throat> this is Egypt, okay? But yet, they stopped counting because there was so much. And now, if you think about it mathematically, it needed to be a lot because 20% doesn't add up to seven years, does it? But yet, this is enough. It ends up being enough, as we see. And why? It's because the Lord is blessing. He's blessing Joseph, and he's blessing the land, just like Pharaoh had hoped. Again, this isn't Joseph coming up with new farming techniques. We don't have that. Right? We don't have new ways to produce crops. No, they're doing it how they've always done it. But God's hand is here. And success is happening, and it is taking place. And not just for Joseph, but for a whole nation and all these people around him. If this wasn't enough of a blessing, uh, we also see in those last couple verses that I read there that the Lord blesses Joseph and his wife with children. There's two boys that are born to this union. The first boy is named Manasseh, and Joseph named him Manasseh on purpose, and he says why. He says, because God had made me forget all of my hardships, made me forget my father's house. This is an interesting discussion that I, I don't want to have today. Maybe you can study this on your own. But it is interesting to think about, why did Joseph never go home? Never once did Joseph check on his family, did he? And you say, well, he was in prison and all that. Yeah, but at this point, he's second in command. And maybe he doesn't personally have time to go check on his parents, but he doesn't even send his servants. He doesn't send anybody to say, hey, can you go check? It's an interesting thing to think about. I'd encourage you to maybe uh, think about that on your own and do some 
some reading. Maybe you can come up with something and tell me one day uh, what you came up with. But he does say this about his son. I'm naming you this. Why? Because God's allowed me to forget everything. Even my father's house. And so we see this blessing of the first child. But then Joseph has a second boy. And in his name, it means fruitful. And so we recognize that Joseph is noticing God's blessing on him, what God has done for him to bring him to this point in his life, all that he has been through. And Joseph is saying, God has blessed me, and he uses his child's name to point that out. There are a couple other fascinating things that you can dive into a little more on your own if you would like. It's interesting that he names them Hebrew names, not Egyptian names. Uh, He still had his faith, this shows. He was still looking to the God of the Hebrews, not to the gods of Egypt. But he was still honoring that. Also, it makes you wonder about his wife. Tradition tells us that his wife converted uh, from her Egyptian religion. And they say, why this happened? The names. The names prove this, that she would have been in line with naming her children. She, She was no small little Egyptian. She was high up there. And so this would have been a big deal to have Hebrew names. But we see this with Joseph, again, being faithful to God, even within his family life, raising his children to love God and to honor God. And we can see this with these names. So where we are so far as we get to verse 52 is great blessing happening throughout the land. So let's finish this chapter. It says, The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, All the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. So we have that after seven years of plenty, and that is a sobering sentence, isn't it? The seven years of plenty, done. Now the seven years of famine. A lot of us kind of think that way, don't we? You think back in your life and you're like, I remember the seven years of plenty. The 60s were so good, or whatever, you know, the, the 70s, whatever, whatever time frame you like. But there are times in our life when that ends, and the famine does come. It comes to everybody. It comes to all of us. And here it is, happening in the land, just as, Joseph had, or just as uh, Pharaoh had dreamed, just as Joseph had said, as God had revealed, now was the difficult time. And so the way it reads, if we read it, it sounds like the famine, the first couple years, was felt outside of Egypt. Right? 54, verse 54 speaks of this. That, that the surrounding lands of Egypt really were feeling the famine instantly, right away. But it, it seems that within Egypt, this ha- wasn't really happening yet. It wasn't taking place. And it, it seems to be agreed upon amongst scholars that probably what had happened was Joseph's plan was adopted by the government, but not just the government— that individual Egyptians had bought into this plan as well. And because of that, they had some food for the first couple of years. You notice he didn't have to open the storehouses just yet in Egypt. It takes a little bit for that to happen. And so it seems like Joseph's influence really had spread throughout the land. And so Egypt fared better than all of the other lands around up until this point, simply because they knew the dreams. They knew the interpretation. And they had Joseph that was leading them. But after some time, it tells us, the lands of Egypt felt the famine as well. And what did they start to do? They begin to cry out for food. Verse 55 is very important for us because it tells us that when all the land was famished, when all of them were hungry, where did they go? Well, they went to their leader, didn't they? They went to Pharaoh. They went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, we're starving. The people, the people are are hungry. We, we need food. And what does Pharaoh say? Go to Joseph. I'm not the man. Right? I'm not, I'm, not the, I'm not the one. You need to go to Joseph. And he says, whatever he says, whatever Joseph says, just, just do what he says. And it's all going to be okay. 
<laughs> we see a great trust, don't we, with Pharaoh and Joseph and the plan that he had put together. And so he has confidence to say, just, just go to Joseph. Now, there's some here who would say Pharaoh's passing the buck. I would say Pharaoh's being a very wise leader. He noticed the hand of God on Joseph before. He put him in place. And now he's letting him do the work that is necessary, the work that he needs to do. And so Pharaoh's not passing the buck. Instead, he's putting his complete trust in Joseph and saying, he knows the answer. Go to him and talk to him. And what happens? Once the people go to Joseph, we see Joseph hears this. What does he do? He opens the storehouses that were put in place. He sells the food to the people of Egypt. Joseph is doing his job. And what Joseph is doing is he is proving himself once again to Pharaoh because it's all working. It is all happening. And so the, the famine eventually becomes so severe that the Bible tells us the surrounding nations have nothing, but yet they are hearing word, there's food in Egypt. Something's going on in Egypt. And so verse 57 tells us the whole earth comes to Joseph for food. The whole earth. Everybody finds themselves in Egypt going there for food. So not only does God use Joseph to save Joseph, but he uses Joseph to save Egypt. And not just Egypt, he uses Joseph to save, according to the scriptures, the whole world. You have this little old Hebrew boy sold into slavery by his brothers because he couldn't even get along with them. Sold to Potiphar, accused of rape, thrown into jail, brought up now by the hand of God to be the most important person in the world. In fact, you could call him the savior of the world because that is exactly what he is in this moment. Just like last week, we talked about the fact that what God is doing here through Joseph is he is keeping the promise that he made to Abraham. We see that still today. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, you remember, God said, I will bless those who bless you, talking to Abraham. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is being fulfilled right before our eyes in Genesis. All the families of the earth are blessed. Why? Because Joseph is providing them food. And so there's salvation found in Abraham's family that's not found anywhere else at all. This brings us to our greater points this morning as we wonder, well, what does this have to do with us today? Well, one could argue if it wasn't for Joseph, we wouldn't be here today. The world would have maybe starved to death. There would be no more. But I hope you catch pretty quickly where this sermon is heading because this story of Joseph is really supposed to point us to something much greater and much bigger, a better Joseph, a bigger Joseph. You see, the, the promise that was made to Abraham wasn't about food. It was about a real blessing that could happen and take place, a, a real change, a, a real blessing for families and which was fulfilled in Jesus. That, that's really the promise that Abraham was given by God, was that one day Jesus is coming. He will be the blessing. Now, Abraham didn't know this. Abraham probably didn't even fully understand that. But that was the promise that was made. And as we read this story about Joseph, we have to think about Jesus, the one who is much greater. There's many parallels in the story with Joseph and Jesus, but this morning, Real quick, I want to just look at four of them, and it'll be quick this morning. I'm sure you have plans, and it's nice outside. I, I get that. I understand that. First is this. In Joseph, we have the rejected servant being made the Savior. We have the exact same parallel with Jesus. This was our focus last week, and so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But Joseph goes from suffering servant to Savior we have this with Jesus as well. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is why Jesus came. Right? He, he came to, to serve. And in his service, we see Joseph being raised up. But that wasn't the case for Jesus. 
In Jesus' service, he was rejected and he was killed. He never had this great coronation as we see with Joseph riding around in the chariot and the knees bowing down to him. That didn't, that didn't happen for Jesus. His service brought him to the cross into which the world and his enemies thought, we will deal with this one. But instead, we know what they did in killing him is they gave him victory, didn't they? They gave him victory because it was death that Jesus used to conquer death, to conquer hell, to conquer the grave for forever. That's part of the reason why we read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8-10 through 10 this morning. Paul's writing says, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, are ashamed of me, his prisoner. He says, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And notice this, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death, and who has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the blessing to all nations. The suffering servant becomes the savior of the world through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And because of him, there is salvation. There is life, right? Where once there is no hope, there now is extreme amount of hope. Sitting in the funeral home this week and listening to Pastor Scott give the eulogy. I would have to imagine for Scott, it was very nice to be able to say, there's hope. Uh, to do a funeral with no hope is one of the saddest things to ever do. But to be able to stand before people and say, listen, this finality of death that hurts and that is hard, God has conquered it through his son Jesus and there is hope because of that. There is hope in that. This is reality. Death is reality. But there's another reality as well that Jesus has conquered it. And we can stand and we can say that. Why? Because Christ came to serve and to give his ransom. Give his life as a ransom for many. This is the promise that we have in the gospel. And so the biggest blow that this world could give only proved to be the plan of God and our salvation. And as Paul says to Timothy there, before the foundations of the world. It wasn't a plan that was like God was saying, oh my gosh, they put him on a cross. What, I didn't expect this. What are we going to do? No, 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 no. This was planned before the foundations of the world. It was known this was going to happen. And it was going to be victory. The second parallel here that I think is very important is that with Joseph, there was only one place to go for salvation. And that was Joseph. Pharaoh even said it himself. Pharaoh really was the greatest man in the world at this point. But even as the people went to the greatest man in the world, Pharaoh knew, I have nothing for you. You need to go to Joseph. See, there was only one person in the land where this could be found, and it was in him. And the Bible tells us the exact same thing about Jesus. Today, when people want to go to God for help, <clears throat> when they want to look to God for salvation, the Bible tells us there's absolutely only one place to go. In Acts chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, we have this in a sermon. It says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus even himself tells us this in the Great Commission when he says, all authority has been given to me. This is what Joseph could have said. Joseph could have said, hey, all authority has been given to me. Look at the ring, my man. I have the signet ring. All authority is mine. I'm telling you build a storehouse. I'm telling you keep back 20%. I'm telling you to do this. And they must do it. And now the whole world in Egypt and Pharaoh, they're all recognizing what? Joseph does have all authority. <laughs> and Joseph does have all power because he has the key to the storehouse. He's the only one who can say, open the storehouse. And so Pharaoh would point everybody to him. Many times people try to find salvation 
They love to talk about church. They love to, they love to talk about God. But, but they think salvation can be found in all different kinds of ways. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's being kind. Maybe it's through Allah. Maybe it's through all these different religions. People will say all roads go to the same place. Right? There's all kinds of inclusivity talk because why we want to be kind to people and so we say well you have a genuine heart God will recognize that and because of your genuineness of course he's going to love you and let you into heaven that's not a loving conversation why because there's only one way to heaven there's only one way for your sins to be dealt with and Jesus is the one who did that and so, so it's only to Jesus you could go. You see, people with Joseph, they might have said, well, my neighbor Marv over here is a really good guy. He's really kind and he's really genuine. He seems to be like a good guy. I'm going to go to Marv and see if he can help me out. Well, don't matter how nice Marv is, if he doesn't have grain for you, Marv's useless because you're going to starve to death. That's the case with all these other religions. That's the case with all of these other roads. The Bible doesn't pull any punches with this. All authority has been given to one person and to one person alone. And that is the man Jesus Christ. Some of my favorite verses in all of scriptures in Hebrews chapter 1. The first four verses. It says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is the Jesus that is proclaimed from this pulpit. That he sits at the right hand of the Father and he alone has authority and power to save you. It is Jesus alone who can do that. That's the most loving thing I can tell you this morning. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. You know, we always have a time of confession and the Bible does speak about confessing sins one to another and we're supposed to do that as a church family. Uh, there's... There's acts of repentance and having to go to brothers and sisters and say, will you forgive me? This church cannot forgive you of your sins because I haven't done anything to do that. Your friend can't save you and absolve you of all feelings of guilt and shame. There's only one person who's earned that right. And it's Jesus. Who's alive and well, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf every single day. He is the mediator, just like Joseph was the mediator between this person and bread. Jesus is the mediator. There's nowhere else to go. There's no other power to turn to. Well, thirdly, quickly, just as Joseph was the one who could give the bread that would be life to people, the Bible speaks of Jesus as the bread of life. All these people would come to Joseph. And they were coming to him. Why? Because they were starving. They had nowhere else to go. It was either go to Joseph or die. And in Joseph's hands laid the bread that they needed. This bread was life or death for them. In the Bible, oftentimes when it talks about bread, we see bread being used in this way, talking about life and death or giving life. You may remember when Satan would tempt Jesus, he would tempt him with bread. Turn these stones to bread. You remember that account? Do you remember Jesus' response to Satan? He would say, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is an interesting phrase that Jesus says. In John chapter 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus himself is the word of God. That he is the word of God. But the Bible also describes Jesus as the bread of life. As I mentioned, we see this in John chapter 6, which should be up on the screen. And notice I want, you, I want you to hear how Jesus says this. It says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, this is after the whole fishes and loaves thing, to put it into some 
So Jesus had been working hard. It says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, for on him God the Father has set his seal. That should sound familiar, don't it? Signet ring. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Now you want to talk about a phrase. You would like come to me as pastor and say, Pastor Tim, I want to know, what do I do as a Christian? What is my calling? We could point to this and say, believe in him. Well, what else? Believe in him. It's not like we have some great, huge, difficult task. We like to talk about that. Uh, but as Christians, we believe in him. People are coming to Jesus. What do we do? He says, believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Remember, these are people who ate the loaves. <laughs> they've, they've seen a pretty good sign. <clears throat> they want more. They say, what work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, that's another interesting phrase, because their fathers hated that bread after a while. They wanted something else. But they're saying, let us see manna. Let us see bread from heaven. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now my guess is most of us in this room have never truly hungered. Most of us in this room have never really known what it feels like to starve. We say that after, at about 2 o'clock, we had lunch at noon. At 2 o'clock, we're like, gosh, I am starving. Is Wendy's Biggie's getting smaller? What in the world? But you got to be honest, you and I, we don't really know what it's like to starve, most of us. Some of you maybe, but not most of us. These people knew what it was like to be starving these aren't rich people. These are people who know exactly what it means to be hungry. And they witnessed the scene where Jesus provided for thousands of people from just a little bit of bread. And they all ate their fill. And now they're coming to him again, and he recognizes this. And he says, what? You're only coming to me because I fed you before. And how do they appeal to him? They say, we want the miracle of bread. And he says, well, you've got to have the bread of life. And of course they're like, they're like the woman at the well, right? You need water that never runs away, a drink that you'll never be thirsty again. They're like, give us this bread so that I'm never hungry again. Are you kidding me? I'll absolutely take it. And he says, well, it's, it's me. Moses didn't give them the manna. God gave them that. And now God gives you me. I'm the bread of life that will satisfy forever. Forever. This is how Jesus portrays himself. I'm the word, I am, I am the bread. You want a full belly, but that's not what you need. You need me. Only in Jesus can one truly be satisfied. I would appeal to you again. Again, as most lovingly as I know how to do, please stop trying to satisfy your soul with the things of this world. I try to do this too, so I'm not being condemning to you. Please hear this as a sinner who's been saved by grace, trying to talk to other sinners, hoping that you will trust in Christ and be saved by grace. This world cannot satisfy your soul. It has a lot of great things to offer, and we can look at Ecclesiastes and see that we're supposed to enjoy a lot of those things. There's so much good in this world, but it will never fill your soul. Moms, you might have some big gathering today, and you love it. 
you have little feet in your house, your family's there again, you're washing dishes again. <laughs> I don't know, that's what happens in ours. <laughs> but you love it. You love seeing the grandkids. You love having your kids back. I have to tell you something. It will not satisfy your soul. They can't do it. And to be honest, you shouldn't put that on them. It's unfair. They can't do that for you. Your job will never satisfy. The, your bank account, it's never going to satisfy you. Your kids' achievements will never satisfy you, ever. But Jesus promises, in him is satisfaction, and it's satisfaction that you desperately need. It's satisfaction for your soul to give you hope, to give you joy, to give you peace, everlasting, everlasting. I go back to death again. I was talking to Joel Waters this morning about it. We push death away. I've said this to you guys so much, and I know that many of you probably don't believe me. It is not good how much we've pushed death away from our lives. There is something to taking life and understanding what's just happened. There's really something about sitting in a room and watching somebody take their last breath. It's difficult. It's hard. But it's the realest thing you can be around. Because that's what all of us have been promised. Death. And Jesus says, I've come and conquered this. I've come to satisfy this. This hurt, this pain that you feel because of death, I have come to satisfy it. And I would encourage you again this morning, take that bread of life. Don't take the other food that's offered out in this world. Take the bread of life and let it nurture you and let it satisfy you. And that brings us to the last thing. It's one of the most beautiful phrases that we see in the story of Joseph. There in the last verse of chapter 41, I don't know if you caught it, but it says, and the whole world goes to Joseph. There was a reason Jesus would be raised up on the cross, and it was for the whole world to see him. It was so that the whole world could come to him. It was so that we could have what he said in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I need you to hear that this morning. Some of you as individuals need to hear that this morning because I'm afraid that in your life, Jesus has always been used as a weapon to make you feel guilty and to make you feel bad, to get you in shape and to get you in line. Your parents would say things like, Jesus sees you. And you're like, oh my gosh, Jesus is creepy. <laughs> That's not the picture we have of Jesus in the Bible. That's what it says in verse 17. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to heal you. Jesus came to satisfy you. And the great news is, it's for the world. This food that was stored in the storehouses, amazingly, wasn't just for Egyptians. They could have said that. They could have absolutely said that. Pharaoh could have said, God gave me the vision for Egypt, and I'm taking care of Egypt. He could have easily said to Joseph, don't let outsiders in. Don't give them any food. That's not how it played out. It says the whole world came to, Je came to Joseph. And he satisfied them with the bread from Egypt. Today, the whole world hears about Jesus. And do you know what? We have brothers and sisters in Christ who already worshiped God this Sunday morning in Africa, in India, in Pakistan, in Russia, all over this world, you and I have family worshiping their father just like we worship that same father this morning. And why is that? It's because Jesus came for the whole world. 
And that includes you this morning. You're like, yeah, but I'm, I'm messed up. Jesus came for those who are messed up. That's what he would say to the Pharisees, right? I ain't come for you guys. The religious, I came for the broken. I came for the hurting. You might say, but I'm insignificant. You might not believe this about me, but that's something that I struggle with. Every room I walk in, I think I'm the least important person in this room. That's part of me being introverted. Because I'm like, I don't, I don't have the right to say anything. I don't need to speak into this. I, I, it really makes me uncomfortable. There's been times where you're like with doctors and nurses and families who's not my family. And they look at you and they're like, well, pastor, what do you think? And I'm like, I'm the least qualified person here. That person in that bed is not related to me. And I am not a doctor. I don't know what you should do. But I know there's people right now, you feel like the most insignificant person in this room right now. Maybe no one's even said hi to you this morning. I hope that's not true, but that might have happened. And you think, I'm just, I can't be seen. Jesus died for you. He absolutely sees you. He sees you so much that he knows you. The Bible tells us he created you. He made you exactly who you are. And then he died for you. In your mess and in your sin. The whole world would come to Joseph. And Jesus says, I died for the whole world to come to me. This morning, I would love to offer to you the bread of life. It was said to us this week at our pastor's conference that we preach Christ. And the amazing thing that happens when Christ is preached that this morning, Jesus preaches to you. You say, well, you think highly of yourself. No, I just told you I don't think very highly of myself. But this morning, Jesus preaches to us through me, through his word, to you. This is how God has set it up. This is how God shows his love to you this morning, for you to hear the word of God. If I could force feed you this bread, I would do it. Right? Right? We do that to our children. We force feed them. We shove it down their throat. We don't care if you like this. You need to eat it. It's good for you. I can't do that to you this morning. I can't force feed you this bread. All I can do is offer it. And I can offer it in a way where I can, with no doubt in my mind, hand it out to you and say, take and eat of this bread. Because in this bread... Is life everlasting. I warn you of all the other food. It's not everlasting. It tastes good for a while. I know. I've tasted it. But the bread of life, Jesus Christ, is the only source of satisfaction. And I would plead with you to take him. To take him. To do what we read Jesus, tell us, what do we have to do to do the works of God? And he says, believe. That's what I ask of you this morning. I'm not asking you to give money, even though I would love to do that. We need it. I'm not asking you to go on some mission trip, even though you can do that. I'm not even asking you to witness to your neighbors today. All I'm asking of you is this. Have you truly taken the bread of life? And tasted of it. Your mom can't do that for you. I can't do that for you. Jesus says you do that. Take and eat. I really hope that you'll do that. This morning. I hope that you'll trust in Jesus. For the forgiveness of your sins. That you'll trust in Jesus. To satisfy your soul. Completely. Because I promise you. He does. He does. Abundantly, abundantly more. Just like, just like that, that grain in Egypt was just so abundant. Christians can tell you that's how Jesus blesses our lives. Abundantly. He loves us and he cares for us. And he offers that to all of us this morning. If you would bow your heads with me and close your eyes. I want to close us with prayer. We're going to sing a song. We do this for you to respond to the word of God this morning. I don't know how you need to respond to him today, but I hope that you will.
Maybe it is by trusting in him. It's not a confusing thing. It's not a hard thing, but it is a miraculous thing when one trusts in God through Christ. It's just an acknowledgement. Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm trusting in you. And that's not, I mean, I say that not as if that's the exact thing you have to say. I'm just trying to show you it's not that difficult. It's a trust in who he is. And the Bible tells us that when we do that, we are saved. Hopefully God does that in your life this morning. God, we do thank you for your salvation. And we thank you for the story of Joseph. And we see how clearly it points to Jesus. How you saved Israel. And we're getting ready to get into the thick of that story with his brothers coming back and all of that. And God, we look forward to that. God, that last verse there. And the whole world came to Joseph. God, we know that one day the whole world will bow their knee to Jesus, whether they have trusted in him or not. We know this in Philippians chapter 2, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So yeah, they might boldly say there's no God. They might do all kinds of things on this earth, but one day they will bow the knee to Jesus. But God, right now, we bow the knee to you, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ the one whom you sent to die for our sins so that we can be in him. And now all of his righteousness has been given to us. God, we thank you for that. That's not something we deserve. That's not something we've earned. It's something you've freely given. And God, we just thank you for that. God, I pray that this morning you would remove the shackles of sin from people's lives, that you would open up blind eyes and deaf ears to help them to see and hear the gospel, maybe for the first time. And that you would save them, that they would take of that bread and trust in you and in you alone. Not in, not in the other things of this world, but in you. God, we thank you that you continue to work and you continue to move. We pray that you would continue that now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me fast When the tempter would prevail He will hold me fast I could never keep my hope Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold he must hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast Those he saves are his delight Christ will hold me fast Precious in his holy sight He will hold me fast He'll not let my soul be lost His promises shall last Bought by him at such a cost he will hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast he bled and died Christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied he will hold me fast 
raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast until our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. And for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Let's bow together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for how good you are to us. We thank you for the song we just sang, that knowing the truth that you hold us fast. Even in life's difficulties, though they seem to drag on and maybe weigh on forever, we do know that you never leave us, you, you never forsake us, and that you do hold us fast. And so, God, we, we praise you for that. God, as we leave this room where we've gathered together to worship you, we head out into our families, into work, into school, all those things that are a part of our lives this week. God, help us to honor you. Help us to glorify you in everything we say and everything we do. God, help us to live satisfied because we know that you have satisfied us completely. And God, I pray that you would give us opportunities to share that satisfaction uh, with others. and Help us to be faithful to that. God, thank you for letting us worship you this morning. We pray that it's, we've done that to the best of our abilities. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless.